Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. I'm always excited for my ladies' room guests, but today I'm particularly excited because this is our first guest ex ever from Australia. And I was really, quite frankly, not expecting this podcast to go international as quickly as it did. Uh, just last week, we had our first international guest from France, and now we're all the way up to Australia. So I'm very excited to tell you about her. Hiba Shahib is co-founder and CEO of the Pelvic Expert or the pelvicexpert.com, which is a digital well-being platform specializing in maternal, menstrual, and hormonal health. So you know she's a great fit for all the things we talk about. She says she was inspired to work in this space following her own challenges with a 15-year history of chronic pelvic pain, which was due to endometriosis, and also after witnessing the devastating effects of birth injury following her sister's first birth. She's a qualified physical therapist in Sydney, Australia, and she has supported more than 2,000 women on their journey to better health and well-being, as well as instructed more than 1,200 therapeutic yoga and Pilates exercise classes. The pelvicexpert.com provides holistic and research-based women-focused online well-being programs to corporations, government, private health insur insurers, workplaces, and most importantly, individuals. She has run um, numerous programs and also has numerous affiliations, including being a founding member of a global working group of women's health physical therapists on a mission to address the World Health Organization's global maternal health crisis goals. She's a specialist advisor for the endometri Endometriosis Special Interest Group, which was formed by Endometriosis New Zealand. And she's a member of the social media and blog acquisition subcommittees, for the International Pelvic Pain Society. All these words are tripping over my tongue today. <laughs> Hiba is highly sought after for her digital health expertise, but my favorite particular digital project that she's done has been to collaborate with TED-Ed to provide pelvic health educational videos, clocking up to 4 million views on her bladder health video in particular, Is It Bad to Hold Your Pee? So far, I expect thousands more viewers after this podcast airs, because that is what we're going to talk about today, as well as numerous other questions which send women running to find a ladies' room. Eva, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's truly an honor and a pleasure. I'm really oh, excited. The pleasure is all mine. Now, to start, one of my favorite questions is to ask women, what was your most interesting, unique, or memorable experience that you ever personally had in a public ladies' room? In a ladies' room, do you mean like a toilet or do you mean just a... Oh, I guess, well, what we, that's what we call it here. So now I guess we have a national dialogue, uh, dialect. Yes, I guess you call it a toilet. We refer to it as a ladies' room or a restroom. <laughs> hmm. Um, let me think. I would have to say um, it would have to be that once... Okay, so um, I guess when I'm... Uh, like if I, ha I have my, I have a 12 month old baby. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> so you. we know the end and of the story has a happy ending. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so sometimes the restrooms, they have baby changing rooms as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I forgot to lock the door. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm changing my baby and someone just opens, someone just comes in and opens the door. And at the same time, I was like, I just breastfed her. So I wasn't completely, um, I guess, you could Rest. say uh, decent, yeah. So, and I'm like, oh, I'm like trying to close the door, trying to change my baby, and I'm like, someone's in here. Um, so I guess that would be probably the most awkward, embarrassing sort of moment that ever happened. <laughs> That's great. Um, yes, I have fond memories of changing my children in all kinds of ladies' room situations that did not have changing tables uh, 23 <laughs> and 24 years ago. So things have really improved. Uh, for the better in, in restroom situations. Thankfully, you thankfully. but still that. with mom brain, you can still forget to lock doors and close things and yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of a shame that we have to go into a toilet 
to breastfeed still mm. in 2018. Mm. But that's a whole nother topic. Anyway, so tell us about your journey with endometriosis. And the reason I said we know the story has a happy ending is because for many women, endometriosis causes infertility. So mm. was that part of your journey? I guess we're starting um, the journey from the, from the current back instead of the other way around. Yeah, well, for me, I would have to say that the endometriosis itself, so the growth of the endometrial tissue, didn't so much affect my um, fertility journey as the actual pelvic pain and the hormonal changes that occur alongside endometriosis. So because of the endo, my body was, you know, I was, I was in adrenal fatigue. I was, um, you know, completely burnt out from pain. Um, you know, it wasn't really in the mood and all of that sort of stuff. So the, the hormones itself um, that impacted was kind of what affected me in terms of fertility. So it took me quite a while to fall pregnant. It took me like, um, I guess not as long for many people, but for me it was a long time. So it took me almost two years. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say it was mostly because of the chronic pain and the, um, and the hormonal issues. Um, because I had, I did have a surgery. I, mean, I only needed to have one surgery, mm -hmm. and that one surgery, um, they were able to remove everything, and it wasn't in any places where um, it was like going to affect the fertility overly. So it wasn't like in the fallopian tubes. It wasn't on the ovaries. It was more just along the vaginal walls and along the bowels and so on. So um, in terms of the location, it was okay fertility-wise. Um, but my journey, I guess, to through endometriosis has been a long one. Um, How old were so, you when you first started having symptoms? So I, I got my period the, um, about a week before my 14th birthday. Mm -hmm. And I was already symptomatic from then. Like I was having severe period pain from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, and there were heavy periods. There were long periods. Um, and over time, um, as the years progressed, those the, that period pain eventually became like chronic pain. So it wasn't just that I was having pain during my period, during the eight days of my cycle, uh, of my menstrual menstruation um, part of the cycle. Which but I was then long, having... a lengthy cycle. Which is a lengthy yeah, cycle. exactly. That's right. So, um, so I was having, you know, the eight days pain and then eventually became that I was having pain on a daily basis. So it became ovulation pain and then it became pain on a daily basis and then it became pain everywhere so not just you know you pain in the uterine area but i was having bladder pain i was having bowel pain i was having leg pain back pain coccyx nice. pain just that whole area started to become i guess it was now sensitized so um i was entering into that chronic pain sort of state um so that that so you know it started when i was about 14 um but i actually didn't end up i didn't get a diagnosis for endometriosis until 11 years later wow. so i was 25 yeah so and it's was that crazy because you hadn't consulted a physician till then or was that because you had cons consulted physicians and they didn't give you the proper diagnosis well i had seen dozens and dozens of doctors and specialists and um you know even even like um physical therapists and osteopaths because i was thinking maybe this is like a musculoskeletal pain and whenever i would go to the doctors they would just say oh that's normal to have period pain or um you know they just dismiss you and no one ever really referred me to a gynecologist i guess also because i wasn't sexually active at the time so it wasn't it, the the culture wasn't to refer on to a gynecologist um, and it wasn't until I actually became a women's health physio uh, or physical therapist that I started to learn more about, um, you know, the, the pelvic, the pelvis and the bladder and the bowel and, and the uterus. And as I was learning more about it and I spoke to more and more um, women's health physios and then it clicked that, hang on, this sounds like endometriosis. And it was actually a women's health physiotherapist who um, was the first one to say, yeah, it definitely is. You need to go see a gyno. And then when I went to see the gynecologist, it was confirmed. Right. Um, but I hadn't, you yeah, know, I, I hadn't actually... To, I would hate to think that a, a gynecologist would ever miss this diagnosis. Yeah, um, exactly. So the gynecologist didn't, thankfully. Let's just take a break for a second and tell our listeners what endometriosis is. So endometriosis is, if you think about the lining of the uterus and the cells that make up the lining of the uterus, those cells should exist just there in the lining. However, in endometriosis, 
Cells that are similar to these uterine lining cells exist in other places as well. So they can exist maybe on your fallopian tubes. They can exist on your ovary. They can exist in your, on your bladder. They can exist on your bowel. They can exist in your vaginal wall, um, in your cervix. They can even exist in other places outside of your pelvis. Like some research has shown that there's endometrial-like cells on um, people's, on, on their brain, on their liver, wow. on, um, yeah, on, on their lungs. Once I had a patient who had it on her lungs, but let's um, explain to people a little more specifically how this happens. So you talked about the cells that are lining the inside of the uterus, the endometrium. Mm. And mm. the way I like to explain it to people is normally that's what you slough off and pass every time you have a period. That's what comes exactly. out is the lining of your uterus. The endometrial cells come out with assorted blood and other fluids. However, the theory is that sometimes that uh, sloughing or that blood can go backwards called a retrograde flow. And therefore the endometrial cells can implant on these various places. We have no idea how they get to places outside of the pelvis or abdomen. That's still a mystery. Um, or if you know, please tell me, because I haven't seen any uh, <laughs> research on that uh, or, or definitive proof of how that happens. But what, what happens is, as a result, this can cause tremendous pain. And what's very weird about endometriosis that we still also don't understand is there's not necessarily a correlation between how many of these implants you have or how big they are and the symptoms. So some mm -hmm. women can have, when we go in there on a laparoscopy, which is, I assume, the surgery that you had, and when yeah. we look, they can have extreme pain, but very few endometrial uh, spots or what we call implants. Um, on the other hand, there are some women who have very large endometrial implants that can even be look like cysts that we can remove and they have really very minor symptoms. Similarly, there's no correlation between the extent of the endometriosis necessarily and infertility. Very often there's a correlation between scarring of the fallopian tube mm. and infertility. But anyway, I just wanna give everybody that background. Um, and this yeah. is very common. And most commonly, the most common symptom that women have is severe pain on the first day of their period. Now, usually when it begins, and your story is a little different because it began very young, but usually when it begins, um, you have very bad pelvic pain on the first day of your period. And then classically, after the first day, it kind of subsides. However, as in your case, there are extreme cases where people have pain throughout their period and then all of the time. Mm, exactly. And it's interesting um, because the, there is some research that is now coming out that's showing that there is a genetic link. So um, we know definitely that women who have a sister or a mother or an aunt that has endometriosis, she's more likely to have it. Um, so the, it, it's possible that perhaps those endometrial cells are there from birth mm -hmm. um, and it's whether they become active um, for, for whatever reason, perhaps um, it could be something in childhood or it could be just the fact that those, scar, those, those tissues grow and become and they scar and they cause adhesions. Um, and these scarring adhesions, as you mentioned, they're what's more likely to cause that infertility. Um, but as you said, pain itself is not necessarily correlated with the extent of the disease. So you could have someone with stage one endometriosis who has significant pain and someone with stage four endo who has very little pain. And really the only reason she finds out she has endo is because um, she's trying to fall pregnant and she can't fall pregnant. She has a laparoscopy and they see the stage four endo. Right. Um, the other thing is because you were diagnosed at an older age, you weren't treated. So I assume you were not on birth control pills or given any other treatment, obviously, until you were diagnosed. And you were yeah, diagnosed so I wasn't. At, at what age? Um, so it was 20, 25. Okay. Yeah, and pretty you, old. <laughs> and do you mind if I ask you how old you are now? I am almost 30. Oh, wow. So it's only been five years. Yeah. A baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A young one. Okay. And are you still having pain now? Um, so I had my daughter 12 months ago, so obviously I was, I haven't had a menstrual cycle. Well, I, I didn't have a menstrual cycle at all, um, in the 12 months since I've had my baby. So and you're I haven't had, are you still breastfeeding? Yes. And I'm breastfeeding. 
So I haven't had a period in almost two years. Mm -hmm. So I Mm -hmm. can't really say that I have any period related pain, but my pelvic pain is significantly better. And that's, that's because of the number of things that I did. So obviously I had the laparoscopy um, a year after I was within the same year that I was diagnosed. So, and and alongside that, let me just tell people the purpose of the laparoscopy is to make a diagnosis, to visualize uh, the whole entire uh, internal side aspect of the pelvis, but also to remove anything that's removable. So in your case, they were Absolutely. apparently able to remove uh, basically all of it. We never say all of it because, of course, there are cells we can't see. Yes. So whatever they could see, they were, they, they, you know, we had an excision laparoscopy, they removed it. And alongside that, I did a lot of work in terms of addressing, you know, my nutrition, addressing my stress levels, making sure that I was still physically active, but not so, not so physically active that I was burning myself out. So just trying to look at my, my life as in a holistic sort of way so that I'm, you know, coming back into my body and making sure that I'm looking after my body from the inside out mm-hmm. um, and just doing a lot of work even with a physical therapist in terms of pain management. So just, you know, trying to train my brain and my nervous system to bring down those, those elevated pain responses um, and just a lot of movement based stuff. And one of the really good things that worked for me was um, actually having some internal release work done by the physical therapist, mm-hmm. because we know that a lot of women who have endometriosis, so about 50% of them will have an overactive pelvic floor. Um, and we know that a lot of women who have pelvic pain also have an overactive pelvic floor, pelvic floor. And that was the same case with me. So doing that sort of work really helped reduce a lot of my pelvic pain. Um, it's, it's just because, you know, when, when you're in pain, you, you clench. And if, you're, if you have pelvic pain, you're going to clench down there. So bringing that that spasm down and relaxing um, the muscles and the nerves there really helped to bring down significantly a lot of my pain and just trying to keep that manage that management plan going um, to keep me as pain free as possible. And today I am relatively pain free. Yay. We love happy Yay. stories here. <laughs> so now let's shift a little bit from endometriosis and pelvic pain to the bladder. I loved your TED Ed uh, cartoon video about, you know, is it okay if I hold my pee? Um, I love it for so many reasons. Obviously, we call this podcast in the ladies' room. So, you know, we're all about all of those things that happen down there, uh, but particularly the bladder. And one of the most common questions I get from people is, am I going to do harm to my bladder if I hold it? You know, and we've all been in situations where we've had to hold it. Um, I was actually interested when I was in medical school in becoming an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and one of, the, one of the reasons I did not become an orthopedic surgeon was because I thought, there's no way I can go that long without peeing. And the idea of wearing a diaper or a suit, which a lot of neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons have to do, was not of any interest to me. So tell me what inspired you to do this and how you developed a relationship with TED-Ed and how this came to be. Yeah, so um, I guess I want to bring, you know, public health education out there to the world, you know, not just to people who have access, but even anywhere in the world. And so um, I I just submitted a a short um, script to TED-Ed and they loved it. And so they decided that they wanted to work with me to do some more. So... Um, We started off with the bladder health one and we have a bowel health one that's also being released this year. Um, So the bladder health one... Please let us know when that comes out. I will, definitely. It's on constipation. So we know a lot of people have that problem. We have already talked about constipation on more than one episode uh, of this podcast. We had a woman, uh, Lisa Belkin, who's an internationally recognized journalist uh, Mm. and writer who talked about having had such severe constipation that she actually had a rectocele. Uh, so that mm. was kind of a serious situation. And then we've also had a gastroenterologist, Dr. Hannah Hindi, uh, came on and talked about how she had uh, severe irritable bowel syndrome, which actually led to her becoming a gastroenterologist. And now she treats yeah. people uh, with this condition. So we love those kind of happy ending stories. But for your Maybe. daughter... I highly recommend a children's book that my kids loved. I don't know if you've seen this. It's called Everyone Poops. Uh, so yeah, I, that's my book recommendation of the day. You'll just have to trust me. It's available on amazon.com. Kids love it. 
it's a kids a kids book on pooping. It's a children's book on right. on called Everyone Poops, and it's Ooh, about how. I'll check it out. It's very useful when you're potty training. <laughs> I will definitely look into that one. Um, yeah, so so we started um, our first video with Ted Ed um, on bladder health and we decided to go with is it bad to hold your pee because it seemed like something that is really relevant mm -hmm. um, and to see, you know, to explore the whole of bladder health but to make it sort of relevant to, to women and, and to, to people in general. Um, so um, the reason I wanted to explore that one was because I actually, it started from my own story. Um, I used to hold my pee mm -hmm. for very long periods when I was young. Um, so I would go like in the morning before school and then I hated going at mm -hmm. school. Like I thought it was just so dirty and disgusting and I just it was a turn off. So I would hold on from basically 7 a.m. until like 4 p.m., mm. which is really bad. Like if you think about it, especially for a child's bladder. And if you're doing this every day for like how many years are you at school? 13 years. Um, that's pretty crazy. So, um, and did you, and I think, did you restrict your fluids as well? Recognizing that if you didn't drink as much water that you wouldn't have to pee as much? Um, I'm not sure that I did because I think I did used to drink, um, well, enough during the day, like I would have recess and lunch mm -hmm. and, you know, I wasn't restricting my fluids that I could think of, um, but I think that's part of the reason why I also led to having an overactive pelvic floor because when you're, when you're um, holding onto your way for that long, your pelvic floor muscles obviously have to tense and then they're tensing for like 13 hours, uh, for like nine hours a day or whatever um, until you finally let them go. So, um, so that's why I, I thought it was a really interesting um, video to write because I know so many people who do it. And one of the things that I would see most in my clinic is, is the overactive pelvic floor. It's so many women coming into my clinic because their pelvic floor muscles are so tight and they end up having um, pain with sex. So they come in because they have pain with sex. But if when I trace back and we talk, we go back to their childhood and we see that they've actually been holding onto their bladder for hours and hours and hours or holding onto their number twos. Like they don't want to go in the public toilet either. Right. So maybe in the morning they didn't go and they're holding it all day. So they're clenching onto their pelvic floors all day. And so I thought, okay, let's, let's explore that. And so we went through and we talked about, you know, what, what is that? What is the bladder? Firstly, what is the urinary system? Um, and then going through what actually happens through that urinary system in, in a functional sort of way. And then at the end, um, what can happen if you do hold onto your pee for so long? Um, and, and they kind of, they kind of um, went a little bit extreme in the video and talked about, um, you know, if your bladder, your bladder can explode or something, but that's, that's you very have a rare. Bladder, right? Yeah. 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 So that's a very rare. They, they added in that little bit um, against my sort of script. Um, so that was interesting. I'm like, oh, I don't want to scare people. But anyways. Um, and then we went through the reasons why people can have an overactive bladder or, or, or they can have, um, if they hold on to their pee, what can happen and how they can just manage it through a couple of little bladder health um, advice and making sure that you are drinking enough fluids, not restricting your fluids either. So it's, it's a nice little interesting video. Um, do watch it. It's about three or four minutes long. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, well, I've watched it a couple of times. Um, you know, it's so relevant to us too, because obviously I was using the title in the ladies room metaphorically uh, for our podcast. Uh, but a, a, as you alluded to, many people hold it, whether it's holding their uh, urine or holding their feces uh, because they don't want to have to use a public restroom, whether it's a restroom mm -hmm. in school or whether it's in the workplace. Uh, travelers very typically get constipation because they don't want to have to go on an airplane or on a train um, and, uh, you know, just holding it, holding it, holding it till they eventually get to their hotel or to their destination. Uh, so this is one thing we have to do a better job with ourselves saying it's okay to use a public toilet, but it's one, it's another thing as a society, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say, this is a global problem, not just here in the United States. Uh, but as a society, we have to do a much better job having cleaner and safer public restrooms. And we actually did have a guest, um, from WaterAid uh, International, who talked about how there are millions of girls around the world who don't go to school because they don't have a restroom there that's clean and or safe 
or that has a proper toilet and they don't have the sanitation products uh, for when they have their periods. So that's a whole nother story that we've already dealt with. Uh, but there's my annual plug for, uh, you know, we have to do a better job with clean restrooms. Anyway, so okay. what are your tips for women to avoid these situations? Um, so just before, just before I go into that, I just wanted to say I completely agree with that. And I want to share a story, actually. Like, okay. I, I just recently came from overseas and I, went, I was in Dubai. Uh -huh. And Dubai have the cleanest toilets. Like, you go into the airport, you go into their shopping centres, everything is just so clean. Like, I actually look forward to going to the toilet there. And then after that, I went to Turkey and oh. in the, the, the toilets were horrible. And I was like, oh, my God. It's like I've literally for Turkey. one day. Yeah. It's like one day difference and, the, you know, like from this like luxury experience to this like a horrific sort of experience. So, you know, if, if, you know, if they've done it in Dubai, so like I know we can do it in, in countries like Australia and in the US and the UK well, and I also so have on. to give a shout but, out to Canada. Canada has amazingly clean public restrooms as well. Um, beautiful. And, they have done, and this, this I even noticed the first time I went to Canada, I was like 10 years old. And I remember as a 10 year old being struck by, you know, just at the rest stops pulling off the highway, the restrooms were incre incredibly clean. But yeah, well, that I makes me look forward. That makes me look forward to going. Yeah, I had an experience going to the restroom in Turkey and at a, at a museum, at a tourist destination, uh, the restroom was literally just a hole in the ground. That was it. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. There's a door. And you walked in thinking you were going into a toilet and it was just a hole. And so that day I did hold it <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> anyway, oh, so gosh. first give me your tips before we, I, I guess the better way to ask for the tips to avoid this situation is talking in a proactive sense. So what are your top tips for women for, for positive bladder health? So um, number one is don't hold onto your pee for too long. So um, and so not about, on a regular basis. Yeah, definitely not on a regular basis. So aim to empty your bladder every three hours or so, and don't leave it for longer than four hours. Mm -hmm. So if you can go every three hours, that's that's a healthy sort of amount of time that that your bladder is slowly expanding. Obviously, if you've drunk a lot of fluids, then you know you might need to go a little earlier. What you should do is listen to your body. So your your bladder will send you a signal when it's moder when it's slightly full, when it's moderately full, and when it's quite full. So before you get to the point where your bladder is so full that you're busting to go, you should be going to empty your bladder. So think about moderately to, to full. That's when you want to go. Don't leave it for too long. If you know that you have a meeting or an event or something, aim to go beforehand and like just check in that you, so that so that you do go. Um, sometimes people who are constipated are more likely to feel that pressure and desire to go as well, um, just because you know when when you're full debt when you're full in your um, bowel, it can place pressure onto your bladder as well. So try and get into a regular habit of emptying your bowels as well every day if you can. Um, and, you know, whether you need to have more fluids or balance your fiber as well so that you're able to empty um, regularly from your bowels as well. Um, so lots of, you know, colorful and leafy vegetables is really important. Um, making sure that you're drinking enough water as well. So for women, on average, you, you want to have about one and a half liters of water per day. So two liters can, can be a lot. Um, and two liters is good if you're quite active. So if you're exercising um, then, then you can have up to two liters, maybe two and a half, but aim to have about one and a half. So remember and of course, here that we're not here in the United States. We're not on the metric system. So what we say oh, to women is eight to 10 glasses a day, which is mm. about 64 ounces, um, which is about a gallon of water a day. Mm. Yes. which is so, about two liters. <laughs> yeah. So, so about six to eight glasses of water is good. Yeah. We um, say eight, eight to 10. Eight to 10. Eight to ten. Is your is your cups a bit different? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Well, those are eight ounce uh, glasses, but since you don't use ounces, I don't know if we can compare that way. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I'm not know, sure I either. Can't really do the math in my head real quickly to find out how many milliliters. So are. maybe the average is eight glasses of water. <laughs> okay, we'll settle on that. <laughs> yeah. What I tell people is the way you know if you're drinking enough water is based on the color of your urine. In mm. general, you know, in general, you want the color of your urine 
to be a very pale yellow. Um, mm. Unlike when you first pee in the morning, usually your pee is a much darker color because you haven't gone all night until you get to be a woman of a certain age. And then you are going in the middle of the night as well. <laughs> That's a whole nother show. Um, <laughs> but in general, I want women to just glance. And you know, if your urine is too yellow, or you know, a, a darker orange or a darker color, um, that means drink more water. Now, obviously, if your urine is red or brown, we want you to consult your physician as soon as possible um, because blood in the urine is never normal unless okay. you're having your period and it just happens to be some blood from your period that's mixing in and causing you unnecessary alarm. Absolutely. And, and actually some women who um, have supplements like B vitamins, they can make their urine quite yellow as well. So just be aware of that. But yeah, you want to make sure. Right. And some other medications. Yeah. So there yeah, are and other medications that we give mm. for, uh, to treat bladder infections. Mm. Uh, Peridium classically will turn your urine bright orange. Um, and then, you know, there's some other foods that can do some interesting things to the odor. That's of the right. <laughs> so I avoid asparagus. <laughs> Asparagus, ah, oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's delicious, mm. but I don't care for that odor at all. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so you, you want it to be like a pale yellow, and if, you don't want it to be too clear either because right. then you're having too much fluid. Right. So your kidneys can also become overworked if you're having too much fluid. And the other thing is, especially for the older ladies, is to make sure that you're not having too much fluids in the couple of hours before bed. So a lot of women I find just... You know, if you just stop your fluids two hours before bed, you can reduce the amount of times you wake up during the night um, to empty your bladder. So two hours before bed, you know, you can have your flu most of your fluids in the first half of the day and then slowly um, trickle down. And then two hours before bed, just try and avoid having fluids because your kidneys do work overnight and um, your bladder is still filling overnight, which is why your urine is so concentrated in the morning. So, yeah, just two hours before bed, just uh, just slow down on the fluids. Um, sometimes women keep a cup of water beside their bed or with their medication. So if you can just shift it back, that can often help as well. So, so I think those matters, are pretty much the main point. It also matters what kind of fluids you're drinking. So not all fluids are created equally. So of course, any beverages with caffeine will cause you to have to pee more frequently and more voluminously. And then also alcohol may help you get into bed, but it will also help wake you up in the middle of the night to have to pee. So Absolutely. those are and classics. And then anything even, acidic. Yeah, anything like carbonated drinks mm -hmm. and um, drinks that have artificial sweeteners as well. So like Diet Coke is probably the worst thing to have because it's caffeine, carbonated and artificial sweeteners. Um, so, so yeah, so if, if you do have urgency, like if you're always feeling like you're busting to go like all the time, then, um, there are a couple of things that you can do, which is eliminating those butter irritants, like, um, as we said, so caffeine, alcohol, um, carbonated drinks, artificial sweetener, um, but also things like, um, you want to make sure that you're, you're also, you can also practice these strategies, which are called urge suppression strategy. Um, so if you're feeling urgency all the time, there's some little strategies that you can do, which are really interesting. So we, we all know the hand on the perineum one, like, you know how sometimes when you're busting to go, you put your hand down there and it kind of helps stop that feeling. But less sort of obvious ones, uh, you <laughs> can... <laughs> acceptable tips. Because if you're in uh, private, you should be able to go to the restroom. <laughs> That's right. So another one that you can do is like curling your toes, curling your toes in your shoes or standing up on your tippy toes and clenching your calf. So what that does is it kind of stimulates a nerve in your um, lower limbs called the tibial nerve, which helps to relax down um, the nerves in your pelvis that make you feel urgent. So clenching your toes or, or tightening your calf muscles can help. And even sometimes distraction techniques. So, you know, pulling out like a Sudoku book or a crossword puzzle, or maybe going through mentally your shopping list so that you're distracting your mind away from those nerves down there that can make you feel really urgent. So, so urge suppression strategies can be really helpful. And even something as simple as um, deep breathing. So taking deep breath and maybe just doing a few little um, pelvic floor squeeze and relaxes just to kind of relax the nerves down there a little that can also help with urgency. So those are kind of the main sort of things that you can do for well, we um, good healthy habits. 
we skipped from beverages directly to your urgency tips, but we skipped over the food recommendations. We also skipped over the number one bladder irritant is nicotine. So mm. of course, I'm always saying that people should stop smoking or not start smoking, but this is yet another reason that people should never smoke. Uh, but foods that are bladder irritants are you know, anything acidic. Mm. Uh, so my favorite- Spicy. Tomatoes. Uh, mm. Spicy foods uh, can be bladder irritants. What else did I forget as far as foods? Blueberries can be- Blueberries? Yeah, blueberries can be you know, irritating to some people for their bladders. Mm. In fact, women with a condition called interstic interstitial yes. cystitis, um, which is not a bladder infection, but related to bladder, terrible bladder pain and inflammation, also mm. have to avoid you know, acidic foods. Yeah, it's interesting with people who have interstitial cystitis, which is also known as painful bladder syndrome, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is quite variable as well in terms of the foods that can affect them. So we know that some women will be triggered by certain foods and other women will be triggered by other foods. But you're right, things like nightshades, like tom tomatoes, can be quite, um, can be quite inflammatory and, and, and aggravating for women who have interstitial cystitis. For everybody um, else, they're a superfood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and spicy foods as well. Um, so, you know, like having simple foods and lots of healthy um, leafy green vegetables is good. Making sure that you're having some healthy fats as well and just some lean protein. Like if you have that nice kind of well-rounded meal um, and, and avoid anything that's like overly spicy or overly, even things like artificial sugars and all of that, mm -hmm. you know, the more, the more, the less processed things are and the more whole foods you eat, hopefully um, the better your symptoms will also be. Great. Anyway, any other tips for bladder health? Um, for bladder health, I would have to say those are probably the, the main ones. Um, so making sure you're emptying regularly, um, avoiding going in a couple of hours before bed, some urge suppression strategies, some food sort of stuff. But most, but one of the most important things is making sure that you avoid constipation. Yeah. Um, those are probably the, the most important sort of things that you can do to maintain a healthy bladder mm -hmm. um, and drinking plenty of fluids. Now, I always have to say, of course, if those things don't work and you are having bladder problems, of course, go see your physician. And of the number course. one bladder problem that women have is pain with urination uh, or mm. burning when they urinate, which is mm. uh, a dead ringer sign for a bladder infection. It's not always a bladder infection um, or a urinary tract infection, mm. but that's easily treated, easily diagnosed. Uh, the next most common bladder or abnormal bladder symptom that women have, of course, is incontinence. So let's talk a little bit about that. And of course, incontinence is just leakage of urine for any reason. Um, so for now, let's just talk about the most common type of incontinence, which especially in women, which is stress urinary incontinence. Mm. So stress urinary incontinence is basically having a bladder accident when you're coughing, sneezing, laughing, jumping, running, exercise during sex, basically anything where there's a large amount of pressure that comes down through your abdomen and onto your pelvic, onto your pelvic floor and pelvic area. Um, and so then you have, a, you, usually it's just a couple of drops that come out, but in some cases it can be quite significant that people wet their undies or they can wet their, their outer clothes. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why women um, develop stress incontinence. So one of the main reasons is pregnancy and birth. Um, the pressure of the uterus on the bladder and on the urethra. Um, when you're, if you're delivering a baby vaginally, that excess stretch on the connective tissue inside your pelvic floor. Um, and then the other main reason is menopause. So the changes in the hormones. So we know that it's essentially either hormones or laxity in your connective tissue um, and weakness in your pelvic floor that contributes to stress incontinence. Or all of the above. Oh, all of the above, of course, yes. <laughs> a combination. I always say exactly. that's the best thing about having had C-sections when I had my children, uh, and I affectionately call C-sections vaginal bypass surgery. Um, uh, yeah. Women who generally have C-sections <laughs> don't generally get bladder problems, for which I am very, very grateful. <laughs> but, you know, actually, there are some women that, I, that have had C-sections um, 
There are some women that can develop it and it's because um, when they when you have a C-section and they cut through, it, it does affect the integrity of the connective tissue around there. And, and if they're moving the bladder out of the way, then some things can get moved around. Um, and some women actually with C-sections can go on to develop prolapse of their uterus. Mm -hmm. And over time with that prolapse of the uterus, um, it, it, you know, the dragging down of those ligaments, connective tissue can also cause that bladder and that urethra to come down as well. So in some cases, some women with C-section can actually go on to develop um, stress incontinence as well, which is interesting. So it's, it's, it, it's not completely a vaginal bypass, but it does definitely lower the risk. <laughs> and the other thing that happens during a vaginal birth that can contribute to bladder problems are episiotomies or tears. Um, and certainly big episiotomies or big tears. So that can also always contribute. Now, talk to us about the role of physical therapy, or I guess what you call physiotherapy uh, in Australia. Um, so talk to us about the role of women's health physical therapy in the treatment of incontinence. Because I, I, my, my thinking is in the United States, we certainly don't refer women to physical therapy nearly enough. For the treatment of these conditions. We generally go right to medication and then right to surgery if medication doesn't work. Yeah, which is a shame because physiotherapy or physical therapy can be really, really, really beneficial for women who have stress incontinence um, and really any type of incontinence. So whether it's stress incontinence, urinary incontinence, whether it's urgency urinary incontinence, and even fecal incontinence. So any type of incontinence, physical therapy can actually be really helpful. And the reason for that is because there are a number of things that we can do. And the first thing which most people often think about is Kegels. Mm -hmm. um, but but we do beyond Kegels. So we actually educate the woman about what's happening in her pelvic floor. And we, we teach her the correct way to activate her pelvic floor. So it's not just a squeeze and let go. It's more than that. It's about trying to connect her entire body with her pelvic floor. So for example, it could be a coordination-based exercise. So making sure that her pelvic floor is activating as she breathes out rather than breathe in. Because we know, and the research shows, that many women who have, um, who have stress incontinence, they are actually letting go of their pelvic floor as they breathe out, and they're squeezing it when they breathe in. And that seems to be the way that you want to do it, but that's actually the incorrect way. What should happen is the pelvic floor should squeeze as you breathe out and let go as you breathe in. Okay, and so I'm we trying. train her. <laughs> it's, not, it's not as easy as it sounds. No, like, it's, it's actually kind of tough. intuitive. Yeah, it's counterintuitive, but that's actually the way that it's supposed to work. Um, and, that's, and the reason for that is because when we breathe in, our diaphragm expands and it, it, kind of, it forces the pelvic floor down. And as you breathe out and the diaphragm shortens, it pulls the pelvic floor up with it. The connective tissue kind of bounces back up. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the way that it's supposed to work. So we teach them that. And then we connect that in with her daily movement, daily movement. So um, it could be, you know, when she squats, when she lifts things up, when she, you know, if she has to carry her baby, if she needs to put a baby into the car, or if she's, you know, picking up um, clothing or whatever it is that the pelvic floor is working the way that it's supposed to. And then beyond that, we also teach her how to activate that pelvic floor in what's called an exercise called the knack, which is it pre cop pre-sneeze, you know, so that it pre-jumping, so that it's coming on as quickly, as quickly and as efficiently and strong as possible before that very forceful activity. So it's 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 more than just a kegel, it's connecting in. And then beyond that, if a woman has stress incontinence and her pelvic floor is like completely not working at all, then we do things like electrical stimulation where we actually you know use a biofeedback machines and a stimulation machines to to get the nerve impulses so that the muscle is able to activate. And in Australia, so I don't know if they do it in the US, maybe the gynecologists do it in the US, but in Australia, um, the physiotherapists here actually fit little support devices called pessaries yeah, or contiforms. Gynecologists will do that here. Yeah. So, so we, we do those as well, um, contiforms in particular, which, which women can buy over the counter, I think. Um, I, I believe in the US you can buy it over the counter, but it's a little support device that goes in intravaginally and it just splints the urethra. Because what happens is that when a woman coughs or sneezes, the, the, the connective tissue that's around the urethra, it's a little bit lax. 
So when she coughs or sneezes, it kind of, the urethra kind of bounces. It's a bit hypermobile because of that connective tissue. So when you put in a little device here, it stops the bouncing from happening. And so they're able to stay continent. They're able to stay in right. control. The angle of the urethra has changed uh, because mm. of the laxity of the pelvic support and the pelvic floor muscles. So a lot of women figure this out on their own, or I guess from talking to their girlfriends. And I've heard many women tell me that they use a tampon on a regular basis, mm. or some mm. women tell me they insert two tampons in order to basically do their own self-help device. Um, That's exactly something that we also recommend better choices uh, than that. Anyway, I want to switch gears a little bit. Actually, just to finish up on the Kegel exercises, the one thing we didn't say is Kegel exercises are so much more effective when done preventively as Absolutely. opposed to doing them when you have a problem. So it just occurred to me when you were talking about teaching women about the whole connectivity of their pelvic floor muscles in general uh, to their whole pelvic physiology, we should be teaching this to girls in high school. Yeah, you know, this should be part of health class. Um, but I guess that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> anyway, so I do want to switch gears. Um, one of the things I was reading about you in an article is uh, about how you were motivated to go into women's health physical therapy from your own experience with chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis. But also in one interview, you mentioned something about your sister having had a you know, really difficult first childbirth experience. Is that something mm. you can share with us? What happened? Yeah, definitely. So um, it's actually really common, unfortunately, for women to have an, what's called an obstetric anal sphincter injury, mm -hmm. which is essentially a, a name for third and fourth degree perineal tears. Um, and it's where a woman, when she gives birth, she tears her perineum into the anus and into the rectum as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so my sister actually had a third degree tear. Um, and, you know, it, it was really terrible because straight after she gave birth, she had to go into surgery. Like they, they're like, you need to go to surgery because it's all torn. And, you know, otherwise you'll had become fecally incontinent. Had she had an episiotomy or it was just she did not have an episiotomy and she, and she had the tear? We don't do episiotomies as often here. So um, it depends on the hospital and the location actually within Australia and, and, and the gynecologist or the obstetrician rather. Um, so she, she was given birth in a hospital with a midwife, midwifery care. So there wasn't an obstetrician there um, and she tore. And, um, and so she was rushed into surgery and she was in surgery for about five to six hours. So that was five to six hours that she was away from her newborn son. Um, and and just to, then, sorry to interrupt, but that is one reason that we believe here that we should err on the side of doing episiotomies so that we can avoid that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a risk benefit ratio. So mm, mm. we don't do them routinely anymore, but mm. we used to. Yeah. So she well, was away well, that's... from her newborn. She had general anesthesia. And what exactly. Else? Well, it's just that, that kind of escalate of, of, you know, so many things that can, mm -hmm. you know, go wrong. And especially after an obstetric anal sphincter injury, many women, they can't even walk. They can't even sit. They can't even empty their bowels without extreme pain down there. Um, so, you know, she, at that point, she needed someone to look after her and look after the baby as well. Um, you know, and you know, you can't do anything. You're, you're in so much pain. You can't empty your bowels, which is really terrifying. You know, you, you get so constipated, but you have to empty it. Otherwise, that causes medicine, pressure on the stitches. And the pain yeah. medicine makes you more constipated. Exactly, exactly. So just this whole sort of thing. And, you know, it, like it's interesting because when you have a cesarean section, the recovery rate also, also is about six weeks, they say. Mm -hmm. um, but generally women are feeling better within one to two weeks. But with, with an obstetric anal sphincter injury and a perineal repair um, and a sphincter repair, it's, it's much longer than that. Like it's at least eight weeks mm -hmm. and women are still struggling usually. Like for my sister, it was up to 12 months, she was still not feeling the same, you know, like that hemorrhoids and, you know, constipation and just so many things just constantly happening. And, and when you have a sphincter, sphincter injury, um, it's kind of a balance between in fecal incontinence and constipation because your, your anal sphincter is not the same anymore. It's, it's been damaged, right? So the nerves are damaged, the muscles are damaged. So you need to make sure that you can strengthen that anal sphincter, but at the same time, not make it so tight that, it, that you get constipated. So it's, it's like a lifetime sort of battle after that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's sad, 
Um, but that's kind of what made me more passionate about women who have birth injury. Mm -hmm. So I see, I've seen a lot of women who have obstetric anal sphincter injuries, but even beyond that, a lot of women who have pelvic organ prolapse, mm -hmm. a lot of women who have what's known as levator avulsion, which is essentially when the actual pelvic floor muscle tears off of the bone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when a woman has that, very often she has all three. She'll have levator avulsion, prolapse, and obstetric anal sphincter injury all and at the same time. Just, you know, for people who are listening who aren't familiar with this, prolapse is when any organ uh, in the pelvis literally falls down and pushes exactly. against whatever other organ. So if you, you can have a uterine prolapse where the uterus can actually protrude into your vagina, and sometimes we can actually just see it at the opening of the vagina. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can have a rectal prolapse where the rectum presses into the vagina. Um, Whatever. And you can have a bladder prolapse. And you can have a bladder prolapse where your bladder hmm. can actually protrude. And you can have a combination of all three. So you can have bladder plus uterus, you can have bladder, uterus, and rectum. You can have rectum and uterus. Like you can have a combination of any three as well. Um, and, and it can be really like, you know, a big change, like from being okay before birth and not knowing that these things can happen and never expecting it. And then you, after you give birth, you know, your whole life sort of changes and you weren't prepared for it. So that's why, as you said, prevention, like you mentioned doing pelvic floor exercises before mm -hmm. even giving birth. I, I, I believe that women should be educated um, about these things even before birth so that they can actually prepare or prevent some of these things from happening. Because, yeah, in high school. You know, yeah, exactly. Because anal sphincter injuries can't, like to an extent you can prevent them, like just... You know, things like not lying on your bed while you're giving birth, like coming up and, you know, on all fours and moving around. You know, there's so many things that we can change to help um, a woman have a healthy and safer birth and reduce the risk of certain injuries. Um, and it's just education. And at the moment, there, there's a lack of that education. And we kind of think that women are going to be afraid, but many women aren't. They, they, they want to be prepared. They want to be empowered. They want to know what can I do to, to have the healthiest, safest birth, but not just the birth, but even beyond that, my motherhood, so that I'm not relying on someone else when I have to look after a baby, mm -hmm. right? Right, absolutely. So one more question about your sister. Obviously, she had this very prolonged, very painful uh, recovery. I always say, you know, your anus is not a part of your body that you should normally be thinking about 24 hours a day. But when you have that mm. kind of pain, it's constantly on your mind. You know, you're constantly aware of it. So did she go through postpartum depression as well? Oh, for sure. Yeah. She was, yeah. I mean, so that's one of the <clears throat> big risk factors for postpartum depression is any kind of birth injury. Injury. Absolutely. So she, I think she, she might have had a bit of trauma as well mm -hmm. because of the whole experience. Um, and, and the sad thing is, and this happens a lot, is that when women have some type of birth injury like this, which then leads to postpartum depression, is that it affects their relationship with their partners as well. And so now she's actually divorced because, you know, just the, the whole thing, like it just affects not just your physical life and your emotional. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. you know, like women should also realise that, you know what, you're not alone. Like it happens mm -hmm. so much. And it's unfortunate that it happens so much. But there are support there are support networks out there and there are, you know, physicians and physical therapists and, you know, psychologists and lots of people who can help you in your journey, regardless of what it is that you've suffered. We actually had a, a guest who was a sex therapist, um, who was um, Dr. Susan Kellogg Spot, who was talking about how men feel when their partners have any kind of condition that causes them to withdraw from having sex or withdraw from the sexual part of their relationship. Obviously, a woman who has postpartum depression is not really interested in having sex. Obviously, a woman who has and is recovering from an anal sphincter repair is not really either interested or advised to have yeah, sex. You can't, her. yeah. And she was telling me, I, I guess I'm so naive. I would have assumed that men would be aware of these things. But she told about a patient, a couple that she was treating, where the man actually thought that his wife was having an affair because she had postpartum depression. She also went straight back to work. Uh, she had twins. Um, and they hadn't resumed sexual activity after about five months after she had the baby. 
And the husband finally blurted out that he assumed she was having an affair because if she wasn't having sex with him, he assumed she was having sex with somebody else. And I just thought, I never would have thought of that in a million years <laughs> after somebody yeah. was having a baby. <laughs> I think, I think that I think men are also naive as well that they think that a woman can just bounce back to her, you know, the way that she felt, you know, before birth or even when she was younger, you know, like things change, you know, like you said, you know, we, we work a lot, you know, so we, women, we need more than just, um, you know, it's not just a quick sort of thing that we can do. We need that time and we need to be emotionally in the, st- in the state. We need to be hormonally in the state, physically, not distracted by a baby, not distracted by work, not distracted by what we need to do at home. Um, there's so many factors. And I think men don't realize that, you know, women physiologically are different to men um, in the well, way yeah. that our sexual response and our arousal responses are. So, yeah. I think the... One of the things I was least prepared for um, after having my first child was just how painful breast engorgement was. Um, You know, I really, and obviously I was a gynecologist and I would advise patients about this, but some things, until you feel it yourself, you really don't have an appreciation. And in my case, just walking down the stairs was so painful because sometimes I would just be so engorged. And, you know, obviously if you're going back to work and breastfeeding and mm-hmm. getting up several times at night, um, you know, it, it really takes its toll in terms of fatigue. So you want to go to bed, but you want to go by yourself. <laughs> exactly. I know. Talk about, I, I, I feel you. Like I've got a 12 month old and she's still not sleeping through the night and it is absolutely crazy and we've just gotten back from overseas so i have jet lag on top of that and she's got jet lag so yeah it's hard being a mom <laughs> yeah it really is and uh i i can console you by saying it doesn't get any easier um <laughs> i'm more than 20 years uh ahead of you and it doesn't get any easier as or as my mother used to say uh little kids little problems big kids big problems Uh, Mm. But one of my children, who shall remain nameless, uh, did not sleep through the night until she was six years old. And she is now in her 20s and still is not a good sleeper. (laughs) So we are having (laughs) having, in a couple weeks, we're having Dr. Michael Bruce, who is a sleep expert, come talk to us in the ladies room. So be sure to tune in for that one. Anyway, I'm going to let you go. uh, But before I do, please tell women how they can find you in the digital space. It's very easy to find me. Um, The Pelvic Expert. So thepelvicexpert.com. If you go on social media, it's always just The Pelvic Expert. So Twitter, The Pelvic Expert, Facebook, The Pelvic Expert, Instagram. Um, And if you're on LinkedIn, I'm also on LinkedIn, but it's Hebe Shahid. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if you, if you come over to my website, thepelvicexpert.com, we've got lots of information on, um, blogs on bladder health, bowel health, sexual health. Um, and I also have a number of like pelvic, um, pelvic floor programs. So there's a couple of free ones that women can join. Um, so if you have, if you have pelvic pain, there's a pelvic pain version. And if you have weak pelvic floor or prolapse or incontinence, there's a weak pelvic floor program as well. Um, So yeah, just visit my website and you should be able to find it there. Okay. And we very often get questions from our listeners. So I will be sure to send them to you. People send them to me on social media at Dr. Dunica, uh, which is D-R-D-O-N-N-I-C-A. But also we have a designated email address for people who want to send private questions, which is askdrdunica at gmail.com. And please let us know when you're constipation video is out on uh, TED Ed because we want to call that to people's attention. And thank you so much for coming all the way from Australia to talk to us today. It's been my pleasure, Donica. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Donica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Donica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.